The contents of today's episode has elements that are triggering for some. Viewer's discretion is advised. Welcome to the Dreadful Archives, a place where your fears prey on your ears. We're your hosts, Jessica and Hannah. recording happy valentine's day happy valentine's day my friend (laughs) how you doing i'm doing pretty good i'm sitting here at the desk just stuffing my face full of my face full of lindor strawberry truffles you know the white chocolate truffles (gasps) so good oh my gosh you know what i miss the friera rocher ferrero rocher you those things those they make coconut ones i cannot have them the spiky the spiky delicious balls yes oh my god they're not gluten-free dude they need to make some gluten-free ones yeah i get regular chocolates but that's okay chocolate chocolate oh i'm so jealous it's so good it sounds good so i know that y'all had fun on valentine's day you got hot pot hot pot is superior it's amazing i love the conveyor belt i do it drives like ah oh oh you just gotta hoard all the mushrooms Nathan was like, don't grab any more mushrooms. He was like, <laughs> he was like, you know, they charge you like thirteen ninety nine a pound of food left over, right? There's a surcharge. He's like, go easy. And I'm like, you go easy. easy. And I'm like, you go easy. And I just pull some more mushrooms off the conveyor belt. <laughs> I didn't know that they did that for food left over. Yeah, if you have like more than a pound left over, then they... They surcharge you thirteen ninety nine to prevent food waste, which is really effective because people don't want to pay thirteen to like pay for food that they've left on the table. So it's pretty cool. That makes, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's better than wasting food. Yeah, it is. I mean, I've always you just gotta you gotta go in hungry. <laughs> Nathan Nathan will go in and be like, I gotta make some room before we go, and I'm like, God, Nathan. <laughs> 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 okay. We're doing, um, I'm cooking tonight. I am making, I am actually torn. Uh, My father brought me a uh, venison roast. And then I I also have some lamb chops, though, which is our traditional Valentine's Day dinner. So I have to try to decide uh, what to make. I don't know yet, but I have a couple, but I have a couple hours. (laughs) One of them needs to go in the freezer. Why not both? Oh, that's a lot of red meat. That's a lot of red meat. Speaking of red meat. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> so today we're uh, doing traveling killers, mm-hmm. uh, essentially. I know that you have an awesome story coming up about the I-95 killer. Something that's local to us. Yeah. It is, and that's the spookiest part about it, is that that's in our, that's in our own backyard. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, my story is not, mine is, mostly takes place in um, the upper west coast. So, like, Washington, um, it's in Maine for, like, five seconds, maybe. But uh, I'm covering the story of Israel Keys. He's a serial killer. Uh, His estimated kills are anywhere between 13, and that's just kind of what he admits to, but based on his flight records and how often he records and how often he traveled, which will make sense in a second, the FBI estimates his actual amount of kills may be up to 37, and he just doesn't remember. Israel Keys was a serial killer who was originally born to a Mormon family. Mm-hmm. He was raised in the church, you know, and he was the second of 10 children, mm-hmm. all of whom were homeschooled. So he never really got a lot of outside interaction. <laughs> By his own words, he had emotional and behavioral issues. He was abused. He he admits that he abused animals animals as a child, specifically cats. Mm. Oh, no, no, no. I know. And it's uh, one of the interesting things about Israel Keys is that he has this weird, mor- he's a serial killer, right? But he has this weird moral code where he doesn't kill dogs. <laughs> he doesn't kill children. And he will not attack people mm. who have dogs, mm. who have dogs 
or children. I guess that's his way of, I don't know, making himself feel better about it on some emotional level. Oh my god. It sounds like um, rationalizing his moral compass. Essentially, yeah. Like, oh, if I don't do this, then it just balances out the evil that I've done. Yeah, exactly. And um, he didn't really, he wasn't a remorseful person. He didn't, he didn't have those, like, for example, his idol, his, the person he looked up to, actually Ted Bundy. And this is, oh, no. again, by his own admission, his FBI interviews, there's about four of them. Uh, we will link to them on the blog. But his FBI interviews are heinous he just laughs like every single interjection he makes like you know some of us like i just did i'll i'll say like like or some people will be like uh whereas israel keys is like Haha. <laughs> murder <laughs> it's horrifying <laughs> it's horrifying oh my god the fbi actually <laughs> the fbi actually hasn't released quite a lot of it because it's just too disturbing it's not human it's not so um, he was, you know, so by his own admission, he went through all these emotional things as a child, behavioral issues. Uh, eventually, I'm very sorry if there's awkward background noises because Maximilian Cash Money Pegasus is being a dick. Your cat. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> He's like, but there's squirrels out there, mother. I want to scratch on the windows. <laughs> That's not very cash money of you. Maximilian. It's, <laughs> I snorted. It's not. It's not very cash money of him. He's doing it right now. Stop it. You stop it. I'm going to kick you out of the room for real, sir. <laughs> I literally just like poked him until he, he's back. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, we're going to move on. Uh, so what, when he was young, his uh, parents actually moved to Washington with him and all nine of his other siblings they joined they joined this crazy extremist church which is something called a christian identity church i i wanted to look it up but i kind of ran out of time because there's just so much else involved with this story but it's an extremist church it was called the ark you know like noah's ark oh my god i feel like that's a bad sign like that's clearly an end of days type of church yeah like bring on more flooding Exactly. And not only that, but this church is well known for being um, anti-Semitic. They have very racist views, ironically. <laughs> so when he was growing up, his neighbors also attended the same church, right? Mm -hmm. His uh, neighbors, as adults, were convicted of murder. Uh, they were white supremacists and that murder, supremacists and that murder, actually, it was he killed his wife his daughter, and a gun dealer, and then in prison joined the Aryan Brotherhood. Oh my god. It's kind of funny how not only was his childhood friend a murderer, but he grew up to be a murderer himself. So by the time he's an adult, though, he actually completely rejects religion, and he becomes an atheist. Mm -hmm. And then in the 90s, his family moves from Washington to an Amish community, in Maine. Uh, Israel Keys isn't really down with this. <laughs> the Amish life isn't for him. So he joins the army in July 1998 after he moved out between the ages of uh, roughly 17 to 19. It, everything that he says is a little bit fuzzy, so we're just going to have some rough years. Okay. So he is uh, eventually, he's stationed in Fort Lewis. He was a good member of the army. He was an excellent uh, service member. He actually got awards for his service and achievement, service and achievement. And then eventually he was honorably discharged. This makes me feel like he was... This makes me feel like he was prepping to be a murderer. It is. So his first crime was actually committed right before he joined the military. Oh my god. And it wasn't a murder. Uh, he was on vacation in Oregon, and they were on this river. You know, uh, it's like here in Florida, you know, people go tubing during the summer, right? Mm -hmm. There was this girl, it was between 1996 and 1998, and he raped her. Ugh. He was a teenager at the time, he remembers that, but he didn't kill her. He let her go after it, and he sent her down the river. Uh, it was never reported, so we don't really know what happened to this girl after that. Oh my god, that's, that's fucked up. That makes me very angry. It's really fucked up. It's very sad. So, jumping forward into April 2009, 
2009, after he gets out of the army, he abducts a woman on the East Coast. Mm. Somewhere. <laughs> he doesn't even know really where himself. That's a consistent pattern that we're going to see with Israel Keys. He does not recall... Yeah, just going around killing people all confused and stuff. Exactly, because he was known, you know, he would re he would travel somewhere. He would rent a car and then drive up to 1,000 miles to find somebody, kill them, and then drive another 1,000 miles to a completely different airport just to go back home to Alaska. Oh my god. It's wild. Uh, and in 2009, this woman that he kills, who he doesn't even recall her name, we do have some speculation about who we believe she is, but... Uh, honestly, we won't know because we've never found are her they, body, but he buried her in upstate New York. Are they still looking for the body? It's likely just a cold case at this point. Um, it, the majority of his, I think that three maybe of his victims, maybe of his victims have actually been found. Mm -hmm. uh, and when he tries to lead them places, he can really only give them a general area because he just... It's so casual to him that it's it's not a core memory. Mm. It's not that he doesn't remember. It's not that he forgot. It's just it was so casual that it never formed a core memory in his brain. He doesn't care enough. Yeah, he just didn't care enough to remember details. It's dark. The next day after that last murder uh, where he buried the body up in New York, mm -hmm. He robbed a bank, and uh, that really kind of just, actually, it, it, it really shows his pattern. So Israel Keys had a pattern. While his victims were random, he always planned his kills. So he would do this thing where he buried kill kits mm -hmm. all over the country. That reminds me of the Golden State Killer who would break into his victims' homes and hide his tools before he actually committed his crime. He actually committed his crimes. It's very similar to that. Yeah, it's like prepping. It's gross. <laughs> yes, and he would hide these kill kits anywhere between two to five years in advance. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. He couldn't remember the victim's <laughs> bodies, but of course he would remember where his kill kits are. Oh yes, he was able to tell us that he had them in Alaska, he had them in Wyoming, New York, Texas, Arizona, probably a couple of other places. Mm. Each kill kit was completely different, but they all contained a couple of the same materials, such as firearms, uh, plastic bags, Drano, because it helps bodies decompose a little bit faster, mm -hmm. uh, other chemicals, <laughs> shovels, physical cash, and extra ammunition. Hmm. Sounds like he was really prepared. It's He always was, and his... What's really scary about him is he didn't have a victim profile. It was based on circumstance and circumstance and location. Mm. So the kill that got him caught, finally, is when he messed up. He killed in his hometown of Anchorage, Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> so, exactly. And gosh, don't we just love it when killers are stupid? Like... Yeah. How many killers get caught that way? Like, uh, the Golden State Killer, like, who, you know, like we just mentioned, he gets caught because he left a water bottle on a trash can, <laughs> or Al Capone because of tax evasion, like, all sorts of different things. I love it. And it, I'm sitting here like, you idiot, but at the same time, I'm like, yes, get yourself caught. Dummy. So the kill that got him caught occurred in 2012, and that was Samantha Koenig. So, Samantha Koenig was a normal 18-year-old girl mm -hmm. living in Anchorage, Alaska. She worked at a drive-up coffee stand called Common Grounds. I like when restaurants have, like, punny... Restaurants have, like, punny names, or, like, it's related to the thing they're selling, like... Isn't that a cool name? <laughs> It was a drive-up coffee stand. You know, you couldn't go there and hang out with your friends. Mm -hmm. You could walk up, order a coffee, get your coffee, leave. You could drive up, get your coffee, get your coffee, and leave. Many, many options. Uh, <laughs> yes. So at around 5 p.m., which in Anchorage, Alaska, is... Dark, dark. Dark night. 5 p.m. in Anchorage, Alaska is nighttime. It is not like here in the States. It is, it is dark, dark. That's because it's, like, farther away from, like, the equator in the sun. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Alaska actually, even in Anchorage, uh, my, my father actually grew up in Alaska. They do have much longer dark nights than we do and uh, much fewer hours of sunlight. And depending on where actually you live in the state, you may not actually have sunlight for several days or even a week or two. I, I always heard it was months. 
It may be months. It may be months. Um, I would have to ask my father, to be perfectly honest. It scares the heck out of me, and therefore I have not Googled it <laughs> myself. <laughs> yeah, so much crime can happen in the dark, guys. So many vampires, too. <laughs> I'm just going to chill down here in Florida where it's warm and we have these nice long days. <laughs> so uh, it's 5 p.m. in Anchorage, Alaska. It's a snowy, dark night. Mm -hmm. So Israel Keys has a police scanner and he finds he's waiting to actually rob this place. That's his original intention as to why he goes to the Common Grounds coffee shop. Mm -hmm. So he gets on his police scanner and is listening and he hears that there's something crazy going on across the city. So all the police are occupied. At this time, he walks up to the window right before close. They closed around 8 p.m., which is at this point, the dead of night in Alaska, mm -hmm. and uh, Alaska, mm -hmm. and uh, he orders specifically an Americano. Samantha turns around, makes his drink, and then as she hands him his coffee, she you can see on the security footage, which I'll try to upload to our blog if possible, but you can see on the security footage that Samantha freezes. She freaks out. Something is happening. We know that he had a gun, and it is at this point that he's likely pointing the gun at her. Yeah. He orders her to turn off the lights, which she does. And she's just, at this point, she's assuming this is a regular robbery. You know, she is following the procedures that they give you when you work in retail. Comply. Do what they want. Give them the money. Survive. Yeah, your life's not worth, you know, the cash. So just listen. Exactly. So she does this. And, uh, you know, she turns off the lights, she gets down on her knees, as he requests, but then he crawls in through the window, he zip ties her, he has her subdued with, within, uh, with, within uh, less than a minute, honestly. It's ridiculously fast. He gets her to go with him, so he leads her out of the coffee shop, and he takes her to his car, they leave. Israel Keys made a couple mistakes during this. One of the mistakes that he made is he didn't account, even though Samantha told him this in her begging, please don't take me, mm -hmm. you know, uh, my boyfriend is on his way to pick me up. He says, oh, well, I'm going to hold you for ransom, but my family doesn't have any money. He doesn't care because when he got there originally to rob, but saw this beautiful woman alone, he definitely switched real quick so that's that's freaky it's so sad her boyfriend comes to pick her up obviously she's not there so her boyfriend um i've i've read a couple different things i've heard a couple different things but from what i understand there from what i understand there was some kind of a tiny little spat earlier in the day or the day before so the boyfriend goes oh her father must have come picked her up i'm going to go to her house and make sure that she's safe so the boyfriend goes over to her house and finds her father and where's samantha oh didn't you pick her up no i thought you were supposed to pick her up so the two of them for whatever reason they wait until morning they call the police and that's really where the investigation begins mm -hmm. but uh <laughs> Meanwhile, quite a couple of things have happened. So during this time, while her father and her boyfriend are discussing where is Samantha, Israel Keys goes back to the coffee shop. He breaks in the same way that he did originally. He crawls in through the window. He takes Samantha's debit card and he goes back. That's dumb because, you know, people can pull records. It is. And actually, that's part of what helps him get caught. So after he kidnapped Samantha, after he kidnapped Samantha, of course, he took her home and he lives with his girlfriend mm -hmm. and his daughter. He has a special shed that is, oh gosh, I've heard many different reports, but it can't even be more than maybe uh, 50 feet away from the house. Oh my God. He has space heaters and he has space heaters in here. And this is where he puts Samantha. Samantha dies the same night that he kidnaps her. After he kidnaps her, he ties her up in this shed. He begins playing loud music and well known to his girlfriend, you don't go in there when I'm in there. You don't go in there ever. You don't go in there without my permission. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> of course, she never goes in there. Later that night, after his girlfriend and his daughter are asleep, he goes back into the shed. Uh, we know that he sexually assaults Samantha and he kills her by choking her to death. The very next day, 
he packs up his he packs up his daughter and his wife and they go down to New Orleans for a cruise. Oh my god. As if nothing happened. Can you imagine being in a relationship with this man, having a kid with him, and then just finding out that 50 feet away in the backyard he was playing music loudly, not to draw attention to himself, but to say, you know, this is a warning, don't come in here. Like, weren't you ever curious about what he was doing? Didn't you ever think to, like, look? You would think so, and it's like, and, and what is that? So, ladies, men, and our non-binary friends, hear me out. Just listen. Just just hear me out for a second. If your partner... Mm -hmm. Listen to us. If your partner has a shed and they tell you that under no circumstances are you allowed to go in there, break the fuck in. Yeah. Go in there. Break in. What is wrong with you? Come on now. There could... Let's just yeah. hear me out. I got your back. Hear me out. I got your back. But break in. But break in. Yes. <laughs> Get a crowbar. Smash that bitch to pieces. Because obviously there's something sketch in there. There is. And we all listen to way too much true crime for us to not break in. Exactly. <laughs> so after they get back from this cruise, this is where it gets really fucked up as though it wasn't already fucked up enough. Mm-hmm. So after his family gets back home from this cruise, he obviously has to do something, right? He needs to figure out what's going on with this body that he left in his shed that has frozen over the past two weeks. Oh, so that's why he chose Alaska. It's, gosh, what a benefit to a serial killer, right? Yeah, just like put a body out in the snow, not have to worry about smell or decomposing. So once he gets home, he sends a text message to her family, and it says something along the lines of meet me at X location, of meet me at X location. Uh, you can find this location online. I don't want to mention it, but it is a dog park. And they go to the dog park, the boyfriend and the father. They get there and they find a paper, a letter. On one side, it says, you mm. know, deposit this amount of money, $30,000, into her bank account because, as we know, he has her debit card and he knows the PIN number because he got it for before he killed her. Uh, and on the other side, and this is actually an image that we will upload to the blog, but please, please view it with uh, extreme caution. On the other side is a photo of Samantha and Israel Keys himself. His arm is extended, holding up a newspaper, trying to confirm life. The thing about this is, Samantha is already dead in this photo. He dethawed her body when he got back from the cruise, put makeup on her, and braided her mm, hair. Mm, mm. And, quote, he learned how to braid her hair because braid her hair because it's the same way that he braided his daughter's hair. No, mm -mm, no, no, no go. Yep. That's a no from me, dog. Yep. So they put this money in Samantha's bank account, of course. And this is essentially Israel Keys' downfall. This is how we begin to catch him. So he tries to take some money out in Anchorage, Alaska, but he gets caught. It's too fast. That's too stupid. That's stupid as hell. It is. Just ask for the 30000 on a suitcase. <laughs> it would be much better. But he has them deposited into her account because he's like, well, you know, he tortured her into giving him the PIN number and he knows. It's, oh gosh, oh goodness. So after he sends them that, you know, letter, they find it, they've put the money in there. He's tried to deposit it. It didn't come out at first, but he decided he's going to, he's got to do, he's going to, he's got to do something. He's got this body in his shed. He can't just leave her there. So she's already thought out, right? He dismembered her. And the way that he disposed of her body was by going to a uh, lake out there in Alaska. And he said he was going ice fishing. He drilled a hole into the ice and dropped her body parts down there. That's fucked up. The really fucked up that's fucked up enough on its own, but what's really fucked? He actually went ice fishing. <laughs> he caught a fish from this hole that he just dumped this corpse into and then brought it home and cooked it for his wife and daughter. I can't, man. I can't do this. <laughs> oh, no. It's, it's, <laughs> it's dark as shit. It is so fucked mm -hmm. up. So, uh, but he gets caught. He gets caught. So let's get to that. So... 
a little while later on March 8th, on March 8th, her card pings in Arizona. So the FBI are all over it at this point. The police in Arizona are alerted to that ping. They go to the bank and they barely miss him by minutes. The next day on March 9th in New Mexico, a surveillance video of him at an ATM is caught. He's hiding his face, he's wearing sunglasses, he has a mask, so they're not able to identify him, but the cameras are able to identify his car. Dummy. <laughs> I love it when they're dumb. Yes. It gives us more to talk about. Exactly. He's driving a 2012 white Ford Focus. They can tell that he's heading toward Houston just based on the different uh, withdrawals that he's making from the various bank, from her bank account, and they send out a bolo, a be on the lookout. Mm -hmm. So a little while later, on March 13th, there's an officer who is just kind of hanging out, you know, patrolling, doing his office, patrolling, doing his officer thing. And he sees a 2012 white Ford Focus in a parking lot at a hotel. He says, isn't this that car from the bolo? So he decides he's going to tail them. He's going to follow them. Eventually, there's a traffic infraction. I've heard a couple different things. Uh, from what I understand, it's not using a blinker. That seems to be the most consistent mm -hmm. explanation. But so he tells him he pulls him over for a traffic infraction. He asks him for his license. He sees his name, Israel Keys. And at this point, it's important to understand that they're looking for this man because he killed Samantha Koenig. They don't understand and they don't know that he's a freaking serial killer. Oh, my God. So he sees his license, and it says Alaska, uh, and they they arrest him on that. They search his car. They find a gun, Samantha's debit card, her cell phone, and the mask that he was using. They also find a, uh, they also find a uh, wad of bills with a dye pod that are dyed, you know, blue from a bank that he had previously robbed. I'm so impatient with these people. <laughs> how, how can you just, like easily leave the evidence where it can be easily found seriously just goes over my brains like I can't <laughs> specifically I think with Israel Keys he thought that he was too smart I don't think he I think he'd gotten away with it so many times that he truly never believed that he would get caught oh so he was emboldened I believe so um very it I yes yes I'm gonna yes I'm a god, you can't touch me, type thing. So much so, he didn't even... Ah, oh, oh, we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> We're almost there. I like the story, it's just, it's creepy. It's very creepy. And it's, it's ominous. So after they catch... So after they catch him, he is extradited back to Alaska. When they get to Alaska, they begin the interviews... During the interviews, Israel Keys says that he's going to confess. He's going to let them know everything that happened. But he has some uh, requests first. <laughs> His request? An Americano coffee. You know, the thing he ordered before killing Samantha. That's, that's fucked up. Yup. A cigar. And specifically, a peanut butter Snickers. <laughs> <laughs> It might have been because he needed a Snickers. Eat a Snickers. You're not you when you're hungry. Me. <laughs> Don't. You're going to give me an asthma attack. <laughs> I'm okay. I'm okay. We're not that kind of true crime podcast. Um. <laughs> uh, so, yes. So... <laughs> Israel Keys is interviewed. He confesses to as much as he can remember, but there's quite a lot that he he just can't remember. And a lot of the assumed killings that we have are just based on these different flights. And you can actually go to the FBI.gov website. Mm -hmm. You can see his interviews for yourself. You can also see the timeline of all of these killings. But he does confess to Samantha's murder. He does mm -hmm. lead the police to the rough area of where her body was. They find a frozen over fishing hole and they do retrieve her, luckily. Um, Israel Keys is, of course, charged with this and the other murders that they are able to uh, associate with him via confession. So Israel Keys specifically mm -hmm. requested the death penalty. 
The death penalty is not an option in Alaska, but in Alaska, but his main concern, and it's very weird for a serial killer and a sociopath to have this concern, but he does not want his girlfriend to ever have to deal with this. And most importantly, he doesn't want his daughter to have to deal with this. He doesn't want her to have to grow up knowing that her father was a serial killer. So he requests the death penalty. This is not an option in Alaska. Israel Keys does everything he can, and eventually he kills himself in prison. We're not entirely sure how it happened, but we know that he had a pencil with a razor blade embedded into the side of it. He slit one of his wrists, and he took his bed sheet, tied it in a makeshift noose around his neck, the other around his ankle, so that when he passed out from blood loss, he would have strangled himself to death regardless. So he... His victims never necessarily got the justice they deserved. Even if he is dead, it's not the same thing. Not in my opinion. He took the opinion. He took the easy way out for a serial killer. Mm -hmm. For a serial killer who wanted the death penalty but was denied it, he could not live with his crimes, which honestly would have been the best justice for his victims and the victims' families who still are living to this day. Because what better... I know that if it was my family member, I would not necessarily want them to have the death penalty. I would want to know that they have to live with that, you know, for the rest yes. of their natural life. I think that would be fair. But that was my story. Israel Keys, super, super uh, effed up, very dark. One of the traveling killers we're talking about today. It is, and uh, I believe that your your story that you're going to tell us today is on the I-95 killer, another killer who traveled, and also uh, had a very specific reason for his killings. Yes, he did. So, disclaimer, before we jump into the story of the I-95 story of the I-95 killer, I just want to express that this person committed crimes against the LGBTQIA plus community, which Jess and I are a part of. We're reporting the history of something that hits home for the both of us, so excuse us if we get a little bit of emotional while reporting this, but I think it's important for people to know the history and understand. Pain is an important part of the LGBTQIA history, so this is important. Mm -hmm. So if we don't tell the history, we're bound to repeat it, and we're bound to, you know... The victim's stories matter. Yes, they do. Okay, so a little bit of background about the I-95 killer, or Gary Ray Bowles, as he is known as. So, Gary Ray Bowles was an American serial killer who killed at least six men who lived in the vicinity of Interstate 95. So, this interstate stretches from Florida to Maine, ending near the Canadian border, ending near the Canadian border. It crosses at least 15 different states. So, that's a lot of state coverage, you know, for one road to have like potential murders and crimes. It really is. It is. So, here is the early life of Gary Ray Bowles. Uh, he was born in Clifton Forge, Virginia, but he was raised in Rupert, West Virginia. His father, Frank, was a coal miner, but he died six months before he was even born from black lung disease, which was a main thing for coal miners to get when they worked in the mines. They would get a lot of black lung disease. Gary's mother, her name was Frances, she remarried several times. Gary's second stepfather was the worst of them all. He was a violent drunk and would abuse Gary, his mother, and his older brother. So, you know, alcohol and men like that just don't mix most of the time. They really don't. It really doesn't. So, the abuse continued for years until Gary had enough of it. So, a lot of sources stated that a lot of sources stated that at the age of 13, he got tired of it and fought back against his stepdad's abuse, which nearly killing him with a rock after smashing him in the head with it. So after that, Gary ran away from home because his mom refused to leave the stepdad, which is kind of fucked up if you think about it. It really is. Why would you choose this abusive man over your child? I mean, this man was abusing them for years and years and years, and Gary finally did something about it, and then, you know, his own mom wouldn't, wouldn't leave the man, so the only way out was to leave, so... It's really sad. It's a really sad backstory, which kind of explains why he went on a killing spree, but it doesn't excuse it. It never excuses it. So. No, there's no excuse. 
Yeah, so Gary was homeless at 13, and in order to survive and make a living, he would often prostitute himself out to gay men. Himself out to gay men. Poor Gary. Yeah, poor Gary. Um, during his trial, his mother and brother testified that at the age of 11, he started doing drugs and huffing paint and getting aggressive. So it was a little bit before he ran away that he started exhibiting signs of aggression and stuff like that, which it could have been helped. It could have been prevented if they would have just left the situation they were in. So now we're going to go along to the beginning of his crimes, which wasn't severe, but they were still kind of like atrocious. So I feel very bad for Gary. I do. I do feel bad for Gary to like some extent, but it's hard because it's like you're a serial killer, but I feel bad for you. <laughs> yeah, I hate that. I hate when I can like pity them and understand where they're coming from. Yeah, like it didn't have to be this way, but unfortunately, you ended up in a really shitty situation and um you weren't given the correct tools and therapy. 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 Therapy, yes. You weren't given the correct tools to correct this and make yourself feel better. Yeah, the parents and the system failed him. The system absolutely failed this man. But at the end of the day, it's his own actions. Always. So this is the beginning of his crimes. In 1982, Bowles was arrested for abusing and sexually harassing his girlfriend at the time. This act sentenced him to six years in prison, but after his release in 1991, he was arrested again after convicted of unarmed robbery. He apparently stole an elderly woman's purse, which landed him an additional four years in prison, but I think he got off early, on only serving two years for, I guess, good behavior. Yeah. So after his release from prison, he moved to Daytona and moved in with a girlfriend, you know, but he was secretly continuing his prostitution work with gay men on the side. So he was keeping it hush hush. Oh my gosh. Hush. Oh my gosh. So his then girlfriend became pregnant, but soon she got an abortion after learning that Bowles was a sex worker. That's really sad. That's really sad and that's really fucked up because there's a lot of stigma about sex work. And there shouldn't be. There's no reason. I Sex work is real work. There shouldn't be. It's, you know, as long as the most important thing is as long as all parties are enthusiastic and consenting. Yeah. So there shouldn't be any stigma about it, you know, as long as you're adults and everything's fine. Agreed. Agreed. But apparently Bowles wanted this kid and it made him really furious. So furious that he turned the blame on gay men. So it was homophobia fueled motives for murder. Despite prostitution with men, Bowles maintained the fact that he was completely straight and he never engaged in any mm -hmm. acts that he found was uncomfortable. He would only, you know, let them perform acts on him that didn't you know so he maintained the fact that he was so he maintained the fact that he was straight whatever that meant to him yeah that yeah whatever that meant to him but that's the reason i feel like he started targeting and preying on gay men was because of the abortion and because the girlfriend so he blamed his prostitution with gay men so why not that's heartbreaking and that's really sad yeah and that's really fucked up and it just makes me so sad it's Nobody under any circumstances should have to hide who they are as a person. And um, I know it's, yeah, it's obviously, it's only February, but we do have Pride Month coming up. And uh, if your family doesn't accept you, we accept you. Just just in case you need some new moms. Yep. Yeah. Just, just so you know. <laughs> yeah. We're your moms. We're your spooky moms. We're your family now. Yes, we're here for you. So if you ever need someone to talk to, you can always reach out to us in our emails or on social media. You know, if you need, you know, if you need help, we're here. Absolutely. We love you guys. 100%. Okay, so this led up to his first murder, which was in March of 1994. Um, he met his first victim, a man named John Hardy Roberts, who had offered him like a temporary place to stay. But after an argument, Bowles beat and strangled Roberts and then stole his credit card. Now, his modus operandi, however you say that in Latin, his M.O., was that Gary, when he killed his victims, he would prostitute himself out to them first, like catching their attention at bars where openly gay people would hang out and stuff. Then he would strangle them, steal their money or assets, and then he would shove objects down his victims' throats using whatever was nearby, like toilet paper, 
towels, leaves, dirt, and even sometimes sex toys. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it was crazy. So the first murder... So, the first murder was pretty gruesome, and then after his first murder, Gary went on a killing spree over the next six months, killing at least four more gay men during that time. And these were gay men that were, like, openly gay. That's awful. It is awful. It's hard enough to be part of the community in 2022, but at this time, oh my god, I can't even imagine. Like, I, I, we were babies. Yeah, in the 90s. Yeah, I was a year old when this stuff was happening. I can't even imagine. His next victims were David Jarman, age 39, Milton Bradley, age 72, Alverson Carter, Jr., age 47, and Albert Morris, age 38. So, during this time, the LGBTQIA community was, like, t being terrorized at this point, and they were, like, scared. They were, like, taking precautious measures because they knew somebody was, like, picking out members of the community and members of the community and, like, targeting them. That's terrifying. Yeah, it is. So we're going to jump into how he was actually caught. And it's a longer story than what I've been telling so far. On May 5th, 1994, a woman working at a golf club in Savannah, Georgia, she found a body lying on the ground of a maintenance shed. Police determined that there had been a very, very, guys, a very violent struggle at the scene. There was so much trauma to the body that the victim's neck was broken and that there was dirt and leaves found stuffed in his mouth. His eyes were protruding out, causing a gruesome scene. So, Captain John Bess, who was working with the Savannah Police Department, said, quote, unquote, there was a lot of rage that went into this murder. There was an excessive amount of force used to kill the victim. It was overkill. That's heartbreaking. Yeah, it really is. And the victim was identified as Milton Bradley. So, two hours from Savannah, Georgia, from Savannah, Georgia, a few days later, Bowles found himself in Hilliard, which is close to us, too. It is very close. Yeah, he was in Hilliard. Uh, a couple realized that their son, Albert Morris, didn't show up for work at the convenience store he worked at, so they did a welfare check on him, discovering that he was dead inside of his trailer after finding evidence of blood outside. They broke in. Wow. So, yeah, there's even pictures online and stuff of, like, the blood trails and stuff inside the trailer. We should add them to the blog if possible. Yeah, if possible. We'll see. It depends on how dark it is. Yeah, can you imagine, like, wanting to check on your son because he didn't show up for work and then you go and you see your son in the state of like horror after being beaten and bludgeoned to death like he ha he was shot he was beaten to death and he had an object shoved down his throat and his pockets were turned inside out because you know Gary was stealing his stuff i can't imagine i i can't imagine i i can't imagine the pain yeah. especially as a parent like uh, no yeah, but this is where he got careless, though. There was a palm print on the TV Entertainment Center. Okay, the police questioned Morris's friends and discovered that Morris had brought a man by the name of Joey Pearson home from the bar one night. He agreed to let Pearson live with him in exchange for odd jobs and cleaning around the house, but apparently things didn't work out as well as he thought it would because they were spotted outside of a bar in a violent fight one night and there were several witnesses that commented on the fight and they helped the police oh yeah they helped the police come up with a sketch of what this person looked like what joey pearson looked like and so the police couldn't find any matches to the name joey pearson so they realized soon enough it was like an alias oh no Eventually, they found a witness who had recently interacted with the killer because he was friends the killer because he was friends with Albert Morris, who was the victim. They found evidence of bulls at a convenience store on film, and they caught his face. So the video was then shown to this person that was Morris's friend. His name was Jackie Strickland, and he recognized the man on the film as Joey Pearson, and he was even like, "That's him. That's the guy." You know, during an interview. That's terrifying. Yeah, it gets more terrifying. So Jackie had spent short time with Joey Pearson and was able to identify him right away. He commented that he believes he was almost killed by Pearson once and that he escaped with his life. So, That's horrifying. I can't imagine. Yeah. 
So when Pearson was living with the victim Morris, uh, Morris had asked his friend Jackie, he was like, hey, can you give Pearson a ride for me? So this is where it gets spooky. Mm-hmm. Jackie had given a ride to Pearson and they were traveling down, wouldn't you know, I-95? Wouldn't you know, I-95, the interstate. <laughs> <laughs> so close to home. So close to home. Strickland was nervous and tried to make small talk to Pearson, who was just casually looking out the window, not bothered by anything. So, you know, he was nervous. Yeah. So, out of nowhere, Pearson tells Strickland, he's like, hey, pull over. So, so Strickland pulls over, does what he asks, and Pearson gets out and starts heading towards the woods off the interstate. And then he comes back out and he's pointing his finger towards something in the woods and tried several times to get Strickland to get out of the car and come see something. How about we don't? <laughs> How about we don't? It's like, it's okay, dude. How about you take a photo and I'm going to hang out in the car. I'll see you in a minute, brah. Yeah. Like, yeah, like that's, you have fun. That's sketchy. That's suspicious. Like, no. That's suspicious. Yes. That's weird. Don't be suspicious. Don't be suspicious. <laughs> um, so so Strickland said that he recalled a voice popping into his head telling him don't get out of this car don't go and follow Pearson stay in the car so that was us yeah it was us <laughs> <laughs> we traveled through space and time to tell Jackie Strickland don't get out of the car, Jackie. It's not worth it. We were it. like, no, <laughs> this is spooky. It's, it's too spooky for you. This is how you die. <laughs> Despite several attempts, Strickland <laughs> refused to get out of the car. Eventually, Pearson gave up, and he came back with a cigarette lit, and he was just nonchalantly like, oh, I just wanted to show you a tent I found in the woods. Like, what's amazing about a tent? Like, yeah, you've seen one tent, you've seen them all. <laughs> I found a tent in the woods that I wanted to murder you in. And I just wanted you to know that it existed. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like he was testing him. Like, is this guy gay? If he's gay, I can offer my services to him. And then if it turns out he's gay, I'll just kill him right here. But if he's innocent, I'll let him go. It almost sounds like a test. Yes. To be perfectly honest. Yeah. It really does. Because he didn't kill him. And... Uh, he's lucky. He was like, I just wanted to show you, you know, this tent I found in the woods. Like, why would you stop randomly if you didn't know the tent was already there? Like, you put that there. <laughs> you wouldn't. <laughs> if there was even such a tent. There's going to be, like, tent folklore, like, the tent of the woods. Like, it's it's got, it's a cryptid now. The tent is a cryptid. <laughs> <laughs> was it there or wasn't it? Did it sprout wings? It's taken on a life of its own. We will never know the true story. Nobody needs to know. Okay, so they, he just got back in the car and they both drove off and Pearson was dropped off at his destination. And this was terrifying when Strickland found out that, Strickland found out that Pearson was actually Bowles, a wanted serial killer on the FBI's top 10 list of fugitives. That's scary. Yes. And he said in the interview, and I quote, to know that I was so close to becoming a victim, this guy was probably probably looking to kill me and run off with my car and the money that I had. He's lucky. Like, your friend is killed by this dude, and before he's killed, you you had to give this dude a ride. And then, you know, he was testing you, and you, you, you just like, nope, not gonna do it. I'm not gonna take your test. This isn't school. And then you just escape with your life still intact. It's, that's a, it, it, gosh, so lucky. I can't even... Yeah, like, I would have, I, I would have not escaped. <laughs> it makes you think back to like Uber drivers and stuff. Like, how many people, how many serial killers have they driven in their cars? Probably too many. I, I'm sure they don't even want to think about it. Too many. <laughs> hmm. How many Uber drivers are serial killers? <laughs> serial killers. <laughs> I'm not taking an Uber anymore. I'm scared now. Dark, dark thoughts. We're moving on. I'm scared We're now. We're moving on. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jess. I've ruined Uber for you. So I take Uber all the time. (laughs) Okay. So, back to how Bowles was actually caught. They took this evidence that they found, the sketches, the handprint on the TV, and they worked with other departments where these murders were strung out. These murders were, like, in Maryland, Savannah, Florida, like, all over. 
six different murders all along the I-95 area. Like, it wasn't directly on I-95, but it was in the same vicinity. So, you know, that's what he was known as, the I-95 killer, because all his victims were close enough, and he would often take the route of I-95 when he was traveling. That's terrifying. It is terrifying. So, dur so during the first murder, you know, John Hardy Roberts... Bowles had carelessly left his probation records from his first time in prison at this house when he was staying with him temporarily, along with fingerprints all over. So that's how they knew that he was, you know, Gary Ray Bowles. His fingerprint matched the one of Joey Pearson, you know, quote unquote Joey Pearson, that had killed Albert Morris and it matched the fingerprint and the handprint that was on the TV set. They even had Bowles on camera at an ATM trying to access Robert's credit card. So they knew what he looked like. So they sketched it, and then they, soon after, the department exchanged fingerprints via fax because, you know, it was the 90s, even though we had computers. Not everybody had emails, and they were still kind of working on the old, you know, system and stuff. So it took a lot longer for them to match and verify, like, fingerprints. We've had fingerprints around since like 1901 when, since like 1901 when I think Scotland Yard started making it yeah. a thing to fingerprint everybody. But we didn't have the technology that we have today to fast analyze fingerprints. So it took a little while for them to be able to be sure that this Bulls guy is actually Joey Pearson. So, yeah. So at the time, that's horrifying. <laughs> like the longer you wait, the scarier it gets. The scarier it gets. <laughs> So, this is how he got caught. You know, it took them a little bit of a while to confirm Bowles was Pearson, as we know. They had made him a wanted man. They announced it on the FBI. You know, there's somebody going up and down I-95 and they're killing somebody. So, watch out. And the victims have been known to be, like, gay people. So, can you imagine being a part of the community and, like, hearing this back in the 90s? I would be scared to go out to any bar. I don't know how. I have to go. I don't know how, but I have to research it some more. But I think it was because of all the speculation he was getting, like all the news and stuff. A TV show actually led to a tip, actually led to a tip to where Bowles was currently oh living gosh. and staying at. But when the police showed up to Bowles' home, he's like, oh, I'm not Bowles. And then he, he pulls out a fake birth certificate with a new social security card underneath the alias Timothy Whitfield. So his new name is Timothy Whitfield. So, because the police investigation was slow, they couldn't, like, confirm that it was Bowles. Like, maybe it was, like, some kind of strange, like, look-alike. Maybe it was, what do they call those when you have someone who looks like you? A doppelganger. Yeah, maybe it was, like, some kind of strange doppelganger. The evil twin. Yeah, there was an email. They couldn't expedite the case. So, Captain Best, who was the head on the case, said, and I quote, his confidence was bolstered, especially when he became Tim Whitfield. Again, there's technology. If they had a fingerprint biometric reader, they could have solved the case right then and there. They could have stopped him right there, but they didn't have the technology then. So that's why he was like bold. He was like, oh, bold. He was like, oh, yeah, I'm Timothy, you know. <laughs> so I'm just going to go kill again. I'm just going to go kill again because I'm Timothy. It's just who I am now. It's who I am as a person. His multiple personalities. <laughs> um, so this seemed to embolden Bowles, and he decided to kill again. His last victim was Walter Hinton of Jacksonville Beach, Florida. That's spooky. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's spooky, because it's, like, close to us. It's only okay. a stone's throw away. Yeah, literally. I was just there last night. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> Well, you're still with us. That's what matters. Yeah, that's what matters. You know, eat hot pot. You'll be safe. Don't go out. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so the place where Bowles was arrested and brought in for questioning. So he was there. Apparently, he had met Hinton, you know, flirted, offered his services and stuff like that. And I guess Hinton took him back to, you know, his place because Hinton was obviously openly gay. Was obviously openly gay. You know, the same M.O. He had a 40-pound stepping stone that he used to bludgeon Hinton in the head with. But apparently, according to, like, the autopsy, Hinton didn't lose consciousness right then and there. And oh he God. even tried struggling and fighting back against Bulls. But he continued to beat him, strangle him, and eventually he shoved toilet paper and a rag down his throat. This is how he was actually caught. He was so, like... 
you can't touch me. You know, I got a new name. My name's Timothy Whitfield and stuff. He got caught because he left a pay stub check under the name Timothy Whitfield at the scene of the crime. Of course he did. (laughs) (laughs) But I don't understand, like, why would you bring your pay stubs when you're going to commit a murder? Like, that's your new name and you're already sullying it. Because, I mean, how else would they know who to give credit to? <laughs> oh my god. I don't even know. I don't even know. I love it when murderers are stupid, though. Because, like, on one hand, I'm like, how can you be such an idiot? But on the other hand, I'm like, yes, please, fuck up. Yeah, Just mess up some more. It's comedy. We appreciate this. Yes, we appreciate it so much. <laughs> we want you to get caught. <laughs> yeah, that's how we got caught. So they were like... Didn't we just leave Timothy's house? <laughs> and stop. <so, laughs> he told us he wasn't bulls. He lied to us, man. He did lie. <laughs> he lied big lies. So he's a big liar. You can't trust him. So they found bulls and hauled him in for questioning. And he actually confessed to all six murders. Wow. So, yeah, he actually confessed. Israel Keys actually confessed to all of his, too. Uh, I guess today is a... Uh, yeah. It's a day of not only traveling killers, but killers who were also uh, quite near the end of their rope. And we're like, okay, yeah, I did it. We're recording on Valentine's Day, so like today's Valentine's Day, so like today's the perfect day for confessions, guys. Happy Valentine's Day again. <laughs> <laughs> I just want you to know I love you. We love you. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna move on to the aftermath. We're nearing the end of the story. Um, Gary was in jail for years. Like, he was arrested in 1994, and he was in jail until, like, 2019. On August 22nd, 2019, he received the death penalty by lethal injection. So, before, when he was first caught, he was asked by investigators, like, why did you confess in the first place? And he replied, So the killing would stop. I didn't want to kill anybody, but I did, and I don't know why. Before his death, they asked Bowles if he had any last words, but he just stayed there and just remained silent. Later after his death, they found a handwritten letter that addressed his actions and even had an apology inside of it for his mother. He said, and I quote, I'm sorry for all I'm sorry for all the pain and suffering that I have caused. I hope my death eases your pain. I want to tell my mother that I am sorry for my actions. Having to deal with your son being called a monster is terrible. I never wanted this to be my life. You don't wake up one day and decide to become a serial killer. These were the last words of Gary Ray Bowles. Wow. Yeah. That's heavy. It is heavy. And and I hate it because it makes you sad and it makes you pity, you know, a killer. And and you don't want to pity. Exactly. You don't want to pity... But at the same time, if if we don't pity the killer, does that not make us as bad as them? I don't know. There's a lot of psychological questions. If you don't feel pity and feel bad and remorse for his situations, at least a little bit some, then you're probably not human. But I can't condone his killings, but I feel like it goes back to the question of his upbringing that was so tragic and yeah, like his upbringing failed yeah. him to the point yeah. him. To the point where he probably had, like, a desperation of survival. But also, I can't excuse his homophobia-fueled, like, killing. Absolutely not. Never. And uh, it kind of brings us back to the situation of uh, two things can be true at the same time. Like, you Mm -hmm. can be somebody who's abused and we can feel bad for you. But at the same time, you can commit absolutely heinous acts that are completely unforgivable. Mm Mm-hmm. The human soul, the human soul and the human mind is very complex. You can feel many things. Exactly. And that's, uh, it's beautiful. It's disturbing. It's interesting. I don't think that we would have this podcast if it wasn't for all the different complexities of the human mind. Exactly. All the spooky loving stuff and all the tragic true crime stuff. The tragic, the anger, the everything. Because, like, while we hate this man so so much so so much at the same time it's a very interesting thing to research so that it's something that we can prevent from being repeated in the future through education Mm -hmm. and i've always found like psychological stuff to be interesting ever since like my college days oh i love it so even though this won't be released on valentine's day it'll be released on the 15th happy valentine's day i hope you had a wonderful spooky day um 
Not too spooky. Don't in- don't encounter any killers. Not too spooky. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully you're safe and having a wonderful day with chocolate and not blood. <laughs> Unless your chocolate is filled with like cordial yeah. cherries oh. and blood. Oh, I need to go get some snacks now. Let's go get snacks. <laughs> snacks? Yes. I love snacks. Yes. Valentine's snacks. Heck yeah. I have a little, yeah, I have a little bit of announcement. I have a little bit of announcement to make for us. We have a YouTube channel now that we have premieres on every Wednesday for each podcast episode. So if you want to come hang out with two spooky ghoulies, you know, chewing some fat with us, yeah, come hang out with us and we'll live chat with you. We're so amusing. You don't, why, why wouldn't you want to hang out with us? Exactly. We're cool people. Bring your snacks, bring your wine. It's going to be great. It's going to be awesome. Yes. Let's talk about murder. Yes. And stuff. Let's talk about murder and stuff and snacks. (laughs) Oh, I love snacks. Let's go get snacks. Can we go get snacks Let's go get snacks. Yeah, we can go get snacks. So I hope you guys liked our episode. You know, we have social media. If you want to follow us, we'll leave all of the important information, the deets, as I like to call it, the Lydia deets. (laughs) <laughs> we'll leave the Lydia Deets in the description box of the podcast and of course on our social medias where you on our social medias where you can follow us and we hope to see you guys soon. So stay safe, stay vigilant out there, and forever be spooky. Yes. Be spookies. Bye. Bye.